The Parthenon, is a former temple on the Athenian Acropolis, Greece, dedicated to the goddess Athena, whom the people of Athens considered their patron. Construction began in 447 BC when the Athenian Empire, was at the peak of its power. It was completed in 438 BC, although decoration of the building continued until 432 BC. It is the most important surviving building of classical Greece, generally considered the zenith of the Doric order. Its decorative sculptures are considered some of the high points of Greek art. The Parthenon is regarded as an enduring symbol of ancient Greece, Athenian democracy and Western civilization, and one of the world's greatest cultural monuments. To the Athenians who built it, the Parthenon, and other Periclean monuments of the Acropolis were seen fundamentally as a celebration of Hellenic victory over the Persian invaders and as a thanksgiving to the gods for that victory. The Parthenon itself replaced an older temple of Athena, which historians call the Pre Parthenon, or Older Parthenon, that was destroyed in the Persian invasion of 480 BC. Like most Greek temples, the Parthenon served a practical purpose as the city treasury. For a time, it served as the treasury of the Delian League, which later became the Athenian Empire. In the final decade of the 6th century AD, the Parthenon was converted into a Christian church dedicated to the Virgin Mary. After the Ottoman conquest, it was turned into a mosque in the early 1460s. On 26 September 1687, an Ottoman ammunition dump inside the building was ignited by Venetian bombardment, during a siege of the Acropolis. The resulting explosion severely damaged the Parthenon and its sculptures. From 1800 to 1803, Thomas Bruce, 7th Earl of Elgin removed some of the surviving sculptures, now known as the Elgin Marbles, with the alleged permission of the Turks of the Ottoman Empire. Since 1975, numerous large scale restoration projects have been undertaken, the latest is expected to finish in 2020. Chapter 1 Etymology The origin of the Parthenon's name is from the Greek word pi alpha rho theta epsilon nu nu, which referred to the unmarried women's apartments in a house and in the Parthenon's case seems to have been used at first only for a particular room of the temple. It is debated which room this is and how the room acquired its name. The Little Scott Jones Greek English lexicon states that this room was the western cellar of the Parthenon, as does J. B. Berry. J. Moore I. D. Green holds that the Parthenon was the room in which the peplos presented to Athena at the Panathenaic festival was woven by the Erephoroi, a group of four young girls chosen to serve Athena each year. Christopher Pelling asserts that Athena Parthenos may have constituted a discrete cult of Athena, intimately connected with, but not identical to, that of Athena Polias. According to this theory, the name of the Parthenon means the Temple of the Virgin Goddess and refers to the cult of Athena Parthenos that was associated with the temple. The epithet Parthenos meant maiden, girl as well as virgin, unmarried woman. The term was especially used for Artemis, the goddess of wild animals, vegetation, and the hunt and for Athena, the goddess of strategy, tactics, handicraft, and practical reason. It has also been suggested that the name of the temple alludes to the maidens, whose supreme sacrifice guaranteed the safety of the city. Parthenos has also been applied to the Virgin Mary and the Parthenon was converted to a Christian church dedicated to the Virgin Mary in the final decade of the 6th century. The first instance in which Parthenon definitely refers to the entire building is found in the writings of the 4th century BC orator Demosthenes. In 5th century building accounts, the structure is simply called New Sigma. The architects Ictinos and Callicrates are said to have called the building Kappa Alpha Tau Mu Pi Epsilon Delta Omicron Sigma, in their lost treatise on Athenian architecture. Harpocration writes that the Parthenon used to be called Hecatompedos by some, not due to its size but because of its beauty and fine proportions and, in the 4th century and later, the building was referred to as the Hecatompedos or the Hecatompedon as well as the Parthenon. The 1st century AD writer Plutarch referred to the building as the Hecatompedos Parthenon. Because the Parthenon was dedicated to the Greek goddess Athena, has sometimes been referred to as the Temple of Minerva, the Roman name for Athena, particularly during the 19th century. Chapter 2 Function 
Although the Parthenon is architecturally a temple and is usually called so, some scholars have argued that it is not really a temple in the conventional sense of the word. A small shrine has been excavated within the building, on the site of an older sanctuary probably dedicated to Athena as a way to get closer to the goddess, but the Parthenon apparently never hosted the official cult of Athena Polias, patron of Athens, the cult image of Athena Polias, which was bathed in the sea and to which was presented the peplos, was an olive wood zoanon, located in another temple on the northern side of the Acropolis. More closely associated with the great altar of Athena. The colossal statue of Athena by Phidias was not specifically related to any cult attested by ancient authors, and is not known to have inspired any religious fervor. Preserved ancient sources do not associate it with any priestess, altar, or cult name. According to Thucydides, during the Peloponnesian War when Sparta's forces were first preparing to invade Attica, Pericles, in an address to the Athenian people, said that the statue could be used as a gold reserve if that was necessary to preserve Athens, stressing that it contained forty talents of pure gold and it was all removable, but adding that the gold would afterward have to be restored. The Athenian statesman thus implies that the metal, obtained from contemporary coinage, could be used again if absolutely necessary without any impiety. Some scholars, therefore, argue that the Parthenon should be viewed as a grand setting for a monumental votive statue rather than as a cult site. It is said in many writings of the Greeks that there were many treasures stored inside the temple, such as Persian swords and small statue figures made of precious metals. Archaeologist Joan Breton Connolly has recently argued for the coherency of the Parthenon's sculptural program in presenting a succession of genealogical narratives that track Athenian identity back through the ages, from the birth of Athena, through cosmic and epic battles, to the final great event of the Athenian Bronze Age, the War of Erechtheus and Eumolpus. She argues a pedagogical function for the Parthenon's sculptured decoration, one that establishes and perpetuates Athenian foundation myth, memory, values and identity. While some classicists, including Mary Beard, Peter Green, and Gary Wills have doubted or rejected Connolly's thesis, an increasing number of historians, archaeologists, and classical scholars support her work. They include, J. J. Pollitt, Brunilda Ridgway, Nigel Spivey, Caroline Alexander, and A. E. Stallings. Chapter 3 Section 1, Older Parthenon the first endeavor to build a sanctuary for Athena Parthenos on the site of the present Parthenon, was begun shortly after the Battle of Marathon upon a solid limestone foundation that extended and leveled the southern part of the Acropolis summit. This building replaced a Hecatompedon temple and would have stood beside the archaic temple dedicated to Athena Polias. The older or pre-Parthenon, as it is frequently referred to, was still under construction when the Persians, sacked the city in 480 BC and raised the Acropolis. The existence of both the Proto-Parthenon, and its destruction were known from Herodotus, and the drums of its columns were plainly visible built into the curtain wall north of the Erechtheion. Further physical evidence of this structure was revealed with the excavations of Poniotis Cavardius of 1885-90. The findings of this dig allowed Wilhelm Dorpfeld, then director of the German Archaeological Institute, to assert that there existed a distinct substructure to the original Parthenon, called Parthenon I by Dorpfeld, not immediately below the present edifice as had been previously assumed. Dorpfeld's observation was that the three steps of the first Parthenon consisted of two steps of porous limestone, the same as the foundations, and a top step of car limestone that was covered by the lowest step of the Periclean Parthenon. This platform was smaller and slightly to the north of the final Parthenon, indicating that it was built for a wholly different building, now completely covered over. This picture was somewhat complicated by the publication of the final report on the 1885-90 excavations, indicating that the substructure was contemporary with the Kimonian walls, and implying a later date for the first temple. If the original Parthenon was indeed destroyed in 480, it invites the question of why the site was left as a ruin for 33 years. One argument involves the oath sworn by the Greek allies before the Battle of Plataea in 479 BC declaring that the sanctuaries destroyed by the Persians would not be rebuilt, 
an oath from which the Athenians were only absolved with the peace of Callias in 450. The mundane fact of the cost of reconstructing Athens after the Persian sack is at least as likely a cause. However, the excavations of Bert Hodge Hill led him to propose the existence of a second Parthenon, begun in the period of Chemon after 468 BC. Hill claimed that the Karl limestone steppe Dorkfeld thought was the highest of Parthenon I was in fact the lowest of the three steps of Parthenon II, whose stylobate dimensions Hill calculated at 23.51 by 66.888 meters. One difficulty in dating the Proto-Parthenon, is that at the time of the 1885 excavation the archaeological method of seriation was not fully developed, the careless digging and refilling of the site led to a loss of much valuable information. An attempt to discuss and make sense of the pots herds found on the Acropolis came with the two-volume study by Graf and Langlotz published in 1925-33. This inspired American archaeologist William Bell Dinsmore to attempt to supply limiting dates for the temple platform and the five walls hidden under the re-terracing of the Acropolis. Dinsmore concluded that the latest possible date for Parthenon I was no earlier than 495 BC, contradicting the early date given by Dorkfeld. Further, Dinsmore denied that there were two proto-Parthenons, and held that the only pre-Periclean temple was what Dorkfeld referred to as Parthenon II. Dinsmore and Dorkfeld exchanged views in the American Journal of Archaeology in 1935. Chapter 3 Section 2 Present Building In the mid-5th century BC, when the Athenian Acropolis became the seat of the Delian League and Athens was the greatest cultural center of its time, Pericles initiated an ambitious building project that lasted the entire second half of the century. The most important buildings visible on the Acropolis today, the Parthenon, the Propylaea, the Erechtheion, and the Temple of Athena Nike, were erected during this period. The Parthenon was built under the general supervision of the artist Phidias, who also had charge of the sculptural decoration. The architects Ictinos and Callicrates began their work in 447 BC, and the building was substantially completed by 432. However, work on the decorations continued until at least 431. The Parthenon was built primarily by men who knew how to work marble. These quarrymen had exceptional skills and were able to cut the blocks of marble to very specific measurements. The quarrymen also knew how to avoid the faults, which were numerous in the pentelic marble. If the marble blocks were not up to standard, the architects would reject them. The marble was worked with iron tools, picks, points, punches, chisels, and drills. The quarrymen would hold their tools against the marble block and firmly tap the surface of the rock. A big project like the Parthenon attracted stonemasons from far and wide who traveled to Athens to assist in the project. Slaves and foreigners worked together with the Athenian citizens in the building of the Parthenon, doing the same jobs for the same pay. Temple building was a very specialized craft, and there were not many men in Greece qualified to build temples like the Parthenon so these men would travel around and work where they were needed. Other craftsmen also were necessary for the building of the Parthenon, specifically carpenters and metalworkers. Unskilled laborers also had key roles in the building of the Parthenon. These laborers loaded and unloaded the marble blocks and moved the blocks from place to place. In order to complete a project like the Parthenon, a number of different laborers were needed, and each played a critical role in constructing the final building. Chapter 3, Architecture The Parthenon is a peripteral octastyle Doric temple with Ionic architectural features. It stands on a platform or stylobate of three steps. In common with other Greek temples, it is of post and lintel construction and is surrounded by columns carrying an entablature. There are eight columns at either end and seventeen on the sides. There is a double row of columns at either end. The colonnade surrounds an inner masonry structure, the cellar, which is divided into two compartments. At either end of the building the gable is finished with a triangular pediment originally occupied by sculpted figures. The columns are of the Doric order, with simple capitals, fluted shafts, and no bases. 
Above the architrave of the entablature is a frieze of carved pictorial panels, separated by formal architectural triglyphs, typical of the Doric order. Around the cellar and across the lintels of the inner columns runs a continuous sculptured frieze in low relief. This element of the architecture is Ionic in style rather than Doric. Measured at the stylobate, the dimensions of the base of the Parthenon are 69.5 by 30.9 meters. The cellar was 29.8 meters long by 19.2 meters wide. On the exterior, the Doric columns measure 1.9 meters in diameter and are 10.4 meters high. The corner columns are slightly larger in diameter. The Parthenon had 46 outer columns and 23 inner columns in total, each column having 20 flutes. The roof was covered with large overlapping marble tiles known as embrices and teguli. The Parthenon is regarded as the finest example of Greek architecture. The temple wrote John Julius Cooper, enjoys the reputation of being the most perfect Doric temple ever built. Even in antiquity, its architectural refinements were legendary, especially the subtle correspondence between the curvature of the stylobate, the taper of the naos walls, and the entasis of the columns. Entasis refers to the slight swelling, of 4 cm, in the center of the columns to counteract the appearance of columns having a waist as the swelling makes them look straight from a distance. The stylobate is the platform on which the columns stand. As in many other classical Greek temples, it has a slight parabolic upward curvature intended to shed rainwater and reinforce the building against earthquakes. The columns might therefore be supposed to lean outward, but they actually lean slightly inward so that if they carried on, they would meet almost exactly 2,400 meters above the center of the Parthenon. Since they are all the same height, the curvature of the outer stylobate edge is transmitted to the architrave and roof above, all follow the rule of being built to delicate curves, Gorham Stevens observed when pointing out that, in addition, the west front was built at a slightly higher level than that of the east front. It is not universally agreed what the intended effect of these optical refinements was. They may serve as a sort of reverse optical illusion. As the Greeks may have been aware, two parallel lines appear to bow, or curve outward, when intersected by converging lines. In this case, the ceiling and floor of the temple may seem to bow in the presence of the surrounding angles of the building. Striving for perfection, the designers may have added these curves, compensating for the illusion by creating their own curves, thus negating this effect and allowing the temple to be seen as they intended. It is also suggested that it was to enliven what might have appeared an inert mass in the case of a building without curves. But the comparison ought to be, according to Smithsonian historian Evan Hadingham, with the Parthenon's more obviously curved predecessors than with a notional rectilinear temple. Some studies of the Acropolis, including of the Parthenon and its facade, have conjectured that many of its proportions approximate the golden ratio. However, such theories have been discredited by more recent studies, which have shown that the proportions of the Parthenon do not match the golden proportion. Chapter 4, Sculpture The cellar of the Parthenon housed the Chryselephantine statue of Athena Parthenos sculpted by Phidias and dedicated in 439 or 438 BC. The appearance of this is known from other images. The decorative stonework was originally highly colored. The temple was dedicated to Athena at that time, though construction continued until almost the beginning of the Peloponnesian War in 432. By the year 438, the sculptural decoration of the Doric metopes on the frieze above the exterior colonnade, and of the Ionic frieze around the upper portion of the walls of the cellar, had been completed. In the Episodomos were stored the monetary contributions of the Delian League, of which Athens was the leading member. Only a very small number of the sculptures remain in situ, most of the surviving sculptures are today in the British Museum in London and the Acropolis Museum in Athens, with a few pieces in the Louvre, National Museum of Denmark, and museums in Rome, Vienna, and Palermo. Chapter 5 Section 1, Metopes the frieze of the Parthenon's entablature contained 92 metopes, 14 each on the east and west sides, 32 each on the north and south sides. 
They were carved in high relief, a practice employed until then only in treasuries. According to the building records, the Metope sculptures date to the years 446 to 440 BC. The Metopes of the east side of the Parthenon, above the main entrance, depict the Gigantomachy. The Metopes of the west end show the Amazonomachy. The Metopes of the south side show the Thessalian Centauromachy. Metopes 13 to 21 are missing, but drawings from 1674 attributed to Jacques Carey indicate a series of humans, these have been variously interpreted as scenes from the Lapith wedding, scenes from the early history of Athens, and various myths. On the north side of the Parthenon, the Metopes are poorly preserved, but the subject seems to be the sack of Troy. The mythological figures of the Metopes of the east, north, and west sides of the Parthenon had been deliberately mutilated by Christian iconoclasts in late antiquity. The Metopes present examples of the severe style in the anatomy of the figures' heads, in the limitation of the corporal movements to the contours and not to the muscles, and in the presence of pronounced veins in the figures of the Centauromachy. Several of the Metopes still remain on the building, but, with the exception of those on the northern side, they are severely damaged. Some of them are located at the Acropolis Museum, others are in the British Museum, and one is at the Louvre Museum. In March 2011, archaeologists announced that they had discovered five metopes of the Parthenon, in the south wall of the Acropolis, which had been extended when the Acropolis was used as a fortress. According to Eleftira Typia Daily, the archaeologists claimed the metopes had been placed there in the 18th century when the Acropolis wall was being repaired. The experts discovered the metopes while processing 2,250 photos with modern photographic methods, as the white pentelic marble they are made of differed from the other stone of the wall. It was previously presumed that the missing metopes were destroyed during the Morosini explosion of the Parthenon in 1687. Chapter 5 Section 2 Freeze the most characteristic feature in the architecture and decoration of the temple is the ionic frieze running around the exterior of the cellar walls. The bas-relief frieze was carved in situ and is dated to 442 BC to 438 BC. One interpretation is that it depicts an idealized version of the Panathenaic procession from the Dipylon Gate in the Keramikos to the Acropolis. In this procession held every year, with a special procession taking place every four years, Athenians and foreigners participated in honoring the goddess Athena by offering her sacrifices and a new peplos dress, woven by selected noble Athenian girls called Ergastines. The procession is more crowded as it nears the gods on the eastern side of the temple. Joan Breton Connolly offers a mythological interpretation for the frieze, one that is in harmony with the rest of the temple's sculptural program, which shows Athenian genealogy through a series of succession myths set in the remote past. She identifies the central panel above the door of the Parthenon as the pre battle sacrifice of the daughter of the king Erechtheus a sacrifice that ensured Athenian victory over Eumolpus and his Thracian army. The great procession marching toward the east end of the Parthenon shows the post-battle thanksgiving sacrifice of cattle and sheep, honey and water, followed by the triumphant army of Erechtheus returning from their victory. This represents the first Panathenaia set in mythical times, the model on which historic Panathenaic processions were based. Chapter 5 Section 3 Pediments the traveller Pisanius, when he visited the Acropolis at the end of the 2nd century AD, only mentioned briefly the sculptures of the pediments of the temple, reserving the majority of his description for the gold and ivory statue of the goddess inside. Chapter 5 Section 4 Subsection 1 East Pediment The figures on the corners of the pediment depict the passage of time over the course of a full day. Tedripa, Helios and Selene are located on the left and right corners of the pediment respectively. The horses of Helios's chariot are shown with livid expressions as they ascend into the sky at the start of the day, whereas Selene's horses struggle to stay on the pediment scene as the day comes to an end. Chapter 5 Section 4 Subsection 2 West Pediment The supporters of Athena are extensively illustrated at the back of the left chariot, while the defenders of Poseidon are shown trailing behind the right chariot. 
It is believed that the corners of the pediment are filled by Athenian water deities, such as the Kephisos River, the Elysos River, and Nymph Kalaho. This belief emerges from the fluid character of the sculpture's body position which represents the effort of the artist to give the impression of a flowing river. Next, to the left river god, there are the sculptures of the mythical king of Athens with his daughters. The statue of Poseidon was the largest sculpture in the pediment until it broke into pieces during Francesco Morosini's effort to remove it in 1688. The posterior piece of the torso was found by Lugerai in the groundwork of a Turkish house in 1801 and is currently held in British Museum. The anterior portion was revealed by Ross in 1835 and is now held in the Acropolis Museum of Athens. Every statue on the west pediment has a fully completed back, which would have been impossible to see when the sculpture was on the temple, this indicates that the sculptors put great effort into accurately portraying the human body. Chapter 5 Section 4, Athena Parthenos The only piece of sculpture from the Parthenon known to be from the hand of Phidias was the statue of Athena housed in the Naos. This massive chryselephantine sculpture is now lost and known only from copies, vase painting, gems, literary descriptions and coins. Chapter 5, Later History Chapter 6, Section 1, Late Antiquity a major fire broke out in the Parthenon shortly after the middle of the 3rd century AD which destroyed the Parthenon's roof and much of the sanctuary's interior. Heruli pirates are also credited with sacking Athens in 276, and destroying most of the public buildings there, including the Parthenon. Repairs were made in the 4th century AD, possibly during the reign of Julian the Apostate. A new wooden roof overlaid with clay tiles was installed to cover the sanctuary. It sloped at a greater incline than the original roof and left the building's wings exposed, thought the Parthenon survived as a temple dedicated to Athena for nearly 1,000 years until Theodosius II, during the persecution of pagans in the late Roman Empire, decreed in 435 AD that all pagan temples in the Eastern Roman Empire be closed. However, it is debated exactly when during the 5th century that the closure of the Parthenon as a temple was actually put into practice. It is suggested to have occurred in circa 481 to 484, in the instructions against the remaining temples by order of Emperor Zeno, because the temple had been the focus of pagan Hellenic opposition against Zeno in Athens in support of Eleus, who had promised to restore Hellenic rights to the temples that were still standing. At some point in the 5th century, Athena's great cult image was looted by one of the emperors and taken to Constantinople, where it was later destroyed. Possibly during the siege and sack of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade in 1204 AD. Chapter 6, Section 2, Christian Church the Parthenon was converted into a Christian church in the final decade of the 6th century AD to become the Church of the Parthenos Maria or the Church of the Theotokos. The orientation of the building was changed to face towards the east, the main entrance was placed at the building's western end, and the Christian altar and iconostasis was situated towards the building's eastern side adjacent to an apse built where the temple's Proneos was formerly located. A large central portal with surrounding side doors was made in the wall dividing the cellar, which became the church's nave, from the rear chamber, the church's narthex. The spaces between the columns of the episodemos and the peristyle were walled up, though a number of doorways still permitted access. Icons were painted on the walls and many Christian inscriptions were carved into the Parthenon's columns. These renovations inevitably led to the removal and dispersal of some of the sculptures. The Parthenon became the fourth most important Christian pilgrimage destination in the Eastern Roman Empire after Constantinople, Ephesus, and Thessaloniki. In 1018, the Emperor Basil II went on a pilgrimage to Athens directly after his final victory over the Bulgarians for the sole purpose of worshipping at the Parthenon. In medieval Greek accounts it is called the Temple of Theotokos Atheniotissa and often indirectly referred to as famous without explaining exactly which temple they were referring to, thus establishing that it was indeed well known. At the time of the Latin occupation, it became for about 250 years a Roman Catholic Church of Our Lady. 
During this period a tower, used either as a watchtower or bell tower and containing a spiral staircase, was constructed at the southwest corner of the cellar, and vaulted tombs were built beneath the Parthenon's floor. Chapter 6 Section 3 Islamic Mosque In 1456, Ottoman Turkish forces invaded Athens and laid siege to a Florentine army defending the Acropolis until June 1458, when it surrendered to the Turks. The Turks may have briefly restored the Parthenon to the Greek Orthodox Christians for continued use as a church. Some time before the close of the 15th century, the Parthenon became a mosque. The precise circumstances under which the Turks appropriated it for use as a mosque are unclear. One account states that Mehmed II ordered its conversion as punishment for an Athenian plot against Ottoman rule. The apse became a mirab, the tower previously constructed during the Roman Catholic occupation of the Parthenon, was extended upwards to become a minaret, a minbar was installed, the Christian altar and iconostasis were removed, and the walls were whitewashed to cover icons of Christian saints and other Christian imagery. Despite the alterations accompanying the Parthenon's conversion into a church and subsequently a mosque, its structure had remained basically intact. In 1667 the Turkish traveller Evli Archileb expressed marvel at the Parthenon's sculptures and figuratively described the building as like some impregnable fortress not made by human agency. He composed a poetic supplication stating that, as a work less of human hands than of heaven itself, should remain standing for all time. The French artist Jacques Carey in 1674 visited the Acropolis and sketched the Parthenon's sculptural decorations. Early in 1687, an engineer named Plantier sketched the Parthenon for the Frenchman Gravier's Dortiers. These depictions, particularly those made by Carey, provide important, and sometimes the only, evidence of the condition of the Parthenon and its various sculptures prior to the devastation it suffered in late 1687, and the subsequent looting of its art objects. Chapter 6, Section 4, Destruction In 1687, the Parthenon was extensively damaged in the greatest catastrophe to befall it in its long history. As part of the Mauryan War, the Venetians sent an expedition led by Francesco Morosini to attack Athens and capture the Acropolis. The Ottoman Turks fortified the Acropolis and used the Parthenon as a gunpowder magazine, despite having been forewarned of the dangers of this use by the 1656 explosion that severely damaged the Propylia, and as a shelter for members of the local Turkish community. On 26 September a Venetian mortar round, fired from the hill of Philippapas, blew up the magazine, and the building was partly destroyed. The explosion blew out the building's central portion and caused the cellar's walls to crumble into rubble. Greek architect and archaeologist Cornelia Chatsiaslani writes that three of the sanctuary's four walls nearly collapsed and three-fifths of the sculptures from the frieze fell. Nothing of the roof apparently remained in place. Six columns from the south side fell, eight from the north, as well as whatever remained from the eastern porch, except for one column. The columns brought down with them the enormous marble architraves, triglyphs, and metopes. About 300 people were killed in the explosion, which showered marble fragments over nearby Turkish defenders and caused large fires that burned until the following day and consumed many homes. Accounts written at the time conflict over whether this destruction was deliberate or accidental, one such account, written by the German officer Sabi Volsky, states that a Turkish deserter revealed to Morozini the use to which the Turks had put the Parthenon, expecting that the Venetians would not target a building of such historic importance. Morozini was said to have responded by directing his artillery to aim at the Parthenon. Subsequently, Morozini sought to loot sculptures from the ruin and caused further damage in the process. Sculptures of Poseidon and Athena's horses fell to the ground and smashed as his soldiers tried to detach them from the building's west pediment. The following year, the Venetians abandoned Athens to avoid a confrontation with a large force the Turks had assembled at Chalcis. At that time, the Venetians had considered blowing up what remained of the Parthenon along with the rest of the Acropolis to deny its further use as a fortification to the Turks, but that idea was not pursued. Once the Turks had recaptured the Acropolis, 
they used some of the rubble produced by this explosion to erect a smaller mosque within the shell of the ruined Parthenon. For the next century and a half, parts of the remaining structure were looted for building material and especially valuable objects. The 18th century was a period of Ottoman stagnation, so that many more Europeans found access to Athens, and the picturesque ruins of the Parthenon were much drawn and painted spurring a rise in Philhellenism and helping to arouse sympathy in Britain and France for Greek independence. Amongst those early travellers and archaeologists were James Stewart and Nicholas Revit, who were commissioned by the Society of Dilettanti to survey the ruins of classical Athens. What they produced was the first measured drawings of the Parthenon, published in 1787, in the second volume of Antiquities of Athens Measured and Delineated. In 1801, the British ambassador at Constantinople, the Earl of Elgin, obtained a questionable firman from the Sultan, whose existence or legitimacy has not been proved to this day, to make casts and drawings of the antiquities on the Acropolis, to demolish recent buildings if this was necessary to view the antiquities, and to remove sculptures from them. Chapter 6 Section 5 Independent Greece when independent Greece gained control of Athens in 1832, the visible section of the minaret was demolished, only its base and spiral staircase up to the level of the architrave remain intact. Soon all the medieval and Ottoman buildings on the Acropolis were destroyed. However, the image of the small mosque within the Parthenon's cellar has been preserved in Jolie de Lobinière's photograph, published in Lerebaus's Excursions de Guerrienne in 1842 the first photograph of the Acropolis. The area became a historical precinct controlled by the Greek government. In the later 19th century, the Parthenon was widely considered by Americans and Europeans to be the pinnacle of human architectural achievement, and became a popular destination and subject of artists, including Frederick Edwin Church and Sanford Robinson Gifford. Today it attracts millions of tourists every year, who travel up the path at the western end of the Acropolis, through the restored Propylia, and up the Panathenaic Way to the Parthenon, which is surrounded by a low fence to prevent damage. Chapter 6, Section 6, Dispute Over the Marbles The dispute centers around the Parthenon marbles removed by Thomas Bruce, 7th Earl of Elgin, from 1801 to 1803, which are in the British Museum. A few sculptures from the Parthenon are also in the Louvre in Paris, in Copenhagen, and elsewhere, but more than half are in the Acropolis Museum in Athens. A few can still be seen on the building itself. The Greek government has campaigned since 1983 for the British Museum to return the sculptures to Greece. The British Museum has steadfastly refused to return the sculptures, and successive British governments have been unwilling to force the museum to do so. Nevertheless, talks between senior representatives from Greek and British cultural ministries and their legal advisers took place in London on 4 May 2007. These were the first serious negotiations for several years, and there were hopes that the two sides might move a step closer to a resolution. Chapter 6 Restoration in 1975, the Greek government began a concerted effort to restore the Parthenon and other Acropolis structures. After some delay, a committee for the conservation of the Acropolis monuments was established in 1983. The project later attracted funding and technical assistance from the European Union. An archaeological committee thoroughly documented every artifact remaining on the site, and architects assisted with computer models to determine their original locations. Particularly important and fragile sculptures were transferred to the Acropolis Museum. A crane was installed for moving marble blocks, the crane was designed to fold away beneath the roof line when not in use. In some cases, prior reconstructions were found to be incorrect. These were dismantled, and a careful process of restoration began. Originally, various blocks were held together by elongated iron H pins that were completely coated in lead, which protected the iron from corrosion. Stabilizing pins added in the 19th century were not so coated, and corroded. Since the corrosion product is expansive, the expansion caused further damage by cracking the marble. 
Chapter 7, Sources Chapter 8 Section 1, Printed Sources Chapter 8 Section 2, Online Sources Chapter 8 Section 3, Videos A Wikimedia video of the main sites of the Athenian Acropolis Secrets of the Parthenon video by Public Broadcasting Service, on YouTube Parthenon by Costas Gavras the History of Acropolis and Parthenon from the Greek TV show Eta Mu Eta Chi Alpha Nu Tau Omicron Upsilon Chi Rho Nu Omicron Upsilon, on YouTube. The Acropolis of Athens in Ancient Greece, Dimensions and Proportions of Parthenon on YouTube. Institute for Advanced Study, The Parthenon Sculptures.